Dear Martin came out of um, the original idea was sparked in 2012 uh, after the death of a young man named Jordan Davis. Jordan Davis was killed in Jacksonville, Florida. He and some friends uh, were at a convenience store. They had their music turned up real loud in the car and somebody pulls up next to them, uh, a man named Michael Dunn, pulled up next to them in the parking lot, didn't like their music or the volume at which they were listening to their music and in response to them refusing to turn it down. He demanded that they turn it down and they said no, so he pulled out his gun. And there's a documentary about this called Three and a Half Minutes that I highly recommend. I had just become a mom when this happened. Uh, my older son was five months old and like looking down at this little person that I spent a long time growing inside my own body and not sleeping because your hips hurt when you're pregnant and you waddle and there are all of these terrible things that happen in the body when you are growing a new person. So I did all this work to create this kid and then the whole process of making sure the kid is out in the world, that didn't feel very good. Um, so I wanted him to stay alive, basically. You know, like you do this work to create this person, you want the person to stay alive. And coming to realize that there might come a day when my little brown boy who will grow up and look like Jordan Davis, will look like Trayvon Martin, will look like these boys who are losing their lives, like people might look at him one day and assume that he's doing something wrong when he isn't. And that's really where the desire to write Dear Martin came from. Um, because I wanted to explore that. I wanted to explore kind of the whys behind black boys being gunned down for no reason a lot of the time. Um, the, Dr. Pink, the Dr. King piece came in a couple years later. So I had this thing going on in my head where I'm like, what's happening? Why are these things happening to these boys? And then after Mike Brown's death, these protests and marches started happening all over the country. These anti-racism protests, um, anti-police violence marches, uh, these non-violent things were happening all over the country. And I kept hearing people quote Dr. King in opposition to them. And that just was like, but what? I remember there was a march planned in Atlanta after the death of, it might have been uh, Freddie Gray. And uh, the mayor got on TV. This is Atlanta, okay? I'm from Atlanta. Dr. King was born and raised in Atlanta. You can go to his house. His house that he grew up in is literally in Atlanta. If you wanna go walk through the kitchen where he used to have dinner, you can do that. So for the mayor of Atlanta to get on the news and say, all I ask is that you don't take the freeways, Dr. King would never take a freeway. What? Who? Who are we talking about here? Um, that shook me up, to be completely honest, to hear the mayor of Atlanta say those words, that Dr. King would never take a freeway. So the, the, the things kind of collided. Um, this idea of taking Dr. King's teachings and his principles and filtering this 21st century high school seniors perspective through those teachings and principles to see really um, how he would do if he tried to live according to his interpretation of how Dr. King would have. Um, and it has, I wrote, I wrote this little book for my two little boys and on Monday I, well let's see, over the weekend I was in the Netherlands and I signed this book in Dutch for two hours. So it's like this thing that I created more for my own understanding, my own increased understanding of the world and how it functions and how my boys will have to move through it has just kind of gone off and done its own thing, even in these other countries. And it is wild.